we, we have to quit trying to form things in these boxes and just allow things to kind of flow in a continuum. Uh, but you gotta love what you do. Uh, I love that people are messy. I, I, I call people messy and wonderful. I'm messy and wonderful. I think it should be that way. It's not controlled and confined. It allows me to be creative, innovative, uh, positive, and uplifting. And I think that makes organizations better when we allow HR to do that. We have the pleasure of welcoming Steve Brown today to our interview series. I'm Ashwara Jain from the People Hub team. Before we begin, just a quick introduction of PeopleHum. PeopleHum is an end-to-end, -end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the PeopleHum blog and video channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Steve is the Vice President of Human Resources for La Rosa's Inc, a regional pizzeria restaurant chain in Southwest Ohio and Southwest Indiana. Steve has been an HR professional for 30 plus years and has worked in the manufacturing, consumer products and professional services industries in various human resources roles. Steve is the author of the book HR on Purpose and an active blogger with his own blog Everyday People. We are extremely happy and honored to have him on our interview series today. Welcome, Steve. It's thrilled to have you. Hi, Ash. It's great to be here. This is exciting. I love the work that People Hum does, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Steve. So, Steve, if we can begin by understanding a little bit about your journey so far, your learnings along the way, most importantly. I think the biggest learning we've had so far is that companies and HR especially have had to become agile. Uh, people talk about it all the time. However, we are reluctant to be agile. Uh, we talk about change management and moving things forward and being comfortable with change, but very, people, very few people are. So now when you're forced with a complete shift within moments, uh, we've really had to move. And I'll give you a great example. In our pizzerias, we have a combination of dine-in, so people can come and eat inside the restaurant, carry-out, so people can come in and just take out, take out orders, uh, or uh, delivery, we will take it to your house. So when the orders came down to no longer allow people in the restaurant itself to dine-in, we had to become a curbside pickup store within one day. We've been talking about it for a long time, and we wanted to move that way, but in order for us to come together, be collaborative, be innovative, and make a solution happen so we could take care of the safety of our team members and serve our guests, it was fascinating to see. Uh, our people are very talented, always have been, and this allowed them to come together for a purpose and make a huge shift. And it allowed us to stay in business and also be very mindful of the situation so that no one feels un un uneasy about working with us. Yeah, and it's interesting to see how people respond. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I've been talking about with our group is <clears throat> we tell people to bring their whole selves to work, but we really don't mean it because we don't want people to bring all of their emotions to work because unfortunately we assume it's going to be negative starting out and it never really is, but our heads tell us it is. Like, oh, I'm going to talk to Ash and she's going to tell me something awful. Now, why we ever think that, I don't know. So now when you see raw emotion, I mean, it's out there. Anything from uh, doubt to, you know, is this really happening to anxiety to uh, how, what's the future gonna hold? It's a great time to step in and embrace that and say, you know, those things are allowed. It's who you are and how can we work with you in order for you to feel that you're at ease, that you're safe and able to do your job. Uh, it's something to learn from going forward. I don't think we wanted to try to compress that in people or, or make them not bring their whole selves to work uh, going forward. Because I, I, we've, I, we've learned, learned only positive things from it. Absolutely. And, you know, since, uh, since this pandemic happened, you know, there would be a lot of changes that, um, you know, the HR specifically would have to have kind of changed in their approach, right? So... Uh, for example, in, in your business, right, in the restaurant business in the U.S., how do you focus on uh, people priority, especially during this pandemic? What have you changed? 
And, well, one of the things that's interesting I've learned, not only in our organization, but in peers I've talked to during this time, I've always felt that companies are people-centric. They won't say that, but you really are. This is a people issue. When you talk about this, this is affecting people's lives. Uh, how do I work? When do I come to work? Uh, we had to change our hours of operation just so people felt safe. So we shrank our hours at our pizzeria so that people didn't feel they were out too late or, expo or potentially exposed to things. Uh, the other thing that it did from a people-centric side of things is really open up lines of communication. In the past, it was layered. Like I would talk to you and you would talk to someone else and they would talk to someone else. And that could be both physically or electronically. And, and you run the chance of things just being lost or the message being changed too dramatically. Now you have to be very concise and quick with your communication. And people are much more willing to talk because they want to be acknowledged, uh, respected, heard, and valued. And those are people things. Uh, those things shouldn't go away when this pandemic comes over. Because if you can come in every day and acknowledge the people for being there and say, thank you for coming. It is such a huge, simple thing, but companies avoid doing it. They expect you to be there instead of being thankful that you're there. And to thank them for the work that they're doing. Uh, we make food. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. We are essential, they call us. And I like that. It's nice to be felt as essential. Uh, but I think people should always be essential. We have people who answer phones, who are call center people. And they're frontline people who are taking people's orders. And what we're learning is that we are feeding people. That's what we do. We happen to be a pizzeria. So it really is nice to see how we can reframe things from a people-centric standpoint. Uh, I think this is not only an HR issue, it's a business issue. So we should try to embrace this going forward because most issues, when you boil them down, come down to people. So I, I'm excited about that, but it's a big learning for organizations and almost an awakening. Yeah, absolutely it is. You know, there are so many elements that we are kind of changing now just to understand, uh, just to empathize with our employees, right? And that's something I want to ask you also, you know, what are the key elements of culture, just not, uh, not just during the pandemic, but also outside of it? What is it that you focus on for your employee experience and just to create a great customer experience at La Rosa? I think there's a couple things. One, I'm trying to teach people to listen to hear, not listen to solve. Sometimes people just want to share and say, this is my experience and I just want to get it out. They're not asking for you to solve their problem. And this is a hard habit to break because typically as people, when we hear the first three, four, five words, we're already saying, okay, I'm going to tell Ash this. And you, you may not want an answer at all. You just want to be heard so the second part we're learning from a culture standpoint is the power of assessment. And by that I mean is assessing at each situation as it comes. I've always been an HR person who believes that HR should be practiced individually versus collectively. There are very few things that have to go across all people at all levels for all reasons. Very, very few. Most of those fall under um, regulations or laws that you have to follow within uh, your country those things are overarching, but the individual experience is more pressing. So from a cultural standpoint, I believe if I can take care of each individual, the whole will work. If I try to take care of the whole, individuals are lost. So I would rather take care of the people who are there individually. It takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more effort. But what I have is uh, better relationships across the board. Uh, there's less silos within the organization because now I'm heard because I'm a part of La Rosa's. Uh, but it is a constant, constant, constant effort. It never stops. So this has not been so much about the pandemic, but now it's able to be practiced more easily because I have more people's attention. Right, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when it comes to just listening to somebody, it should not really be, as you said, just to solve an issue, but actually to hear them out, to understand, uh, you know, what they are going through. And that I think is also empathy in a way. And uh, 
you know, there are a lot of hardships, I think, that the HR is facing, particularly at this point in time. So do you have some advice or, you know, something that the HR should be aware of at this point in time? Yes, I think the one thing that HR people are very, very bad at is we take care of everybody else, but don't take care of ourselves. This is a very emotionally trying time for everybody and a very uncertain time for everybody. Well, that anxiety and that emotional well-being is as true for HR people as anybody else. Uh, we have 1,200 team members at La Rosa's on that I'm not responsible for, but I work with, either directly or indirectly. And boy, it's a lot of energy. I mean, you just get worn out. Uh, at the end of the day, you're just like spent. So what we do is if we don't have good connections, either uh, through our families, through our friends, through our social networks, we're kind of isolated and we're an island. And that's very detrimental because if you're not healthy, you can't take care of others. So I think uh, for an HR person, self-help is essential first. Secondly, uh, HR people need to be more intentional. Uh, we tend to say, you know, I'll just work with you and everything's okay and yay. And it's, you know, I'm a big support function and, oh, you said, what a great day today. I know the world's falling apart, but we're all in it together. People don't want to hear that. <laughs> uh, they want you to meet, I believe you should meet people where they are, not where you think they should be. So uh, I have people from every kind of background there is. I have 16-year-olds that I work with. I have 80-year-olds that I work with. I have people who have a high level of education. I have people who have no education. It's much more important for HR people to meet people where they are, not come in saying, I'm from the office or I'm from HR and here I come. It's we're people. We just forget that we're people. Uh, HR people tend to be more about a position and a posture than they are as a human. Uh, the more real we are, uh, genuine, authentic, all the words that people throw around, unfortunately, way too freely. Um, you know, when people are upset, I get upset. When people laugh, I laugh. When people cry, I cry. Not from a fake standpoint, but uh, we're just not intentional enough. The third thing, Ash, is this. Um, we have to get out of the feeling that we can't speak to anybody at any level. Uh, I have daily conversations with my CEO on purpose. He talks to me, I talk to him. And we talk about life and business and all kinds of things. I also have daily conversations with our receptionist and our frontline cook and our janitor. Uh, HR should be there for every single person. So you're, my role is this. If there are people in a department, that's where HR is. So the more intentional we are, the less regimented we are, the less focused on regulations and structure and policies. It's more about relationships and situations, and then you can apply all the good tools you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I totally agree with you, Steve. You know, it's really about meeting them where they are. And that's such a, such a good point, an important point. And uh, I think, you know, HR will definitely benefit from this because not a lot of them are aware about this. You know, as you said, that it's more about their position, about their title, you know, entitlements when they come into the picture, it just becomes, uh, it, it's not the right way to go. It's not being genuine as such. And when you talk about uh, uh, the tools or let's say technology, if it has to be used by the HR, how do you think it ensures uh, good employee relations and what's the right use of technology here? That's a great question. I think technology and HR tech in general needs to be both applicable and tangible. So for me, the user experience is the most important. If it's confusing, it just makes people frustrated. So uh, if you look at uh, a self-service portal, where I need to change my address. I'll give you a great example. We do open enrollment for our health insurance every year. And so my team goes out and meets everybody in the pizzeria. We sit down with you and we say, Ash, okay, here's your uh, health insurance information. What do you wanna do? Now we have the tech that they can do this on their own, but they kind of like meeting us on top of the tech. So I see it more as intertwined instead of go to something, 
I, I really hate the idea of everybody saying, go to my website, go to this portal, go to this uh, platform. It should be, hi, how are you? Meet me at the platform. Let's work on this together. And what's funny is, uh, even though we have a self-service portal, every time I go out, about 20 people change their address. And I said, you know you can change this on your own. When did you move? And I meet with them in December. And I said, oh, I moved in March. Oh, I moved in January. I said, you know, the technology is there. So I think there's a gap from us relying on technology just as a standalone platform. We have to continually educate, lead, and shepherd people to use the tools that are in front of them. Uh, then, you know, it, any platform can be great. Uh, so if it's a learning management system, if it's a performance management system, as long as you're actually keeping the human element within the tech, I think it works really well. Right, right. That's quite insightful, Steve. And I also wanted to ask you, you know, since you said you work with 16-year-olds and you also work with 80 year olds you know, how is it that you kind of work with uh, millennials and what kind of insights do you have when you work with somebody who's a baby boomer, somebody who's a Gen Y or, you know, Gen Z, and then someone who's a millennial? How do you cope with that? Oh, well, I, I have a much different perspective than most. Uh, it's funny. Generations have been in the workplace forever. This is not new. Uh, what's funny is I don't want to separate you because of your age. I want to know you because of who you are. I know old people who have a younger spirit than most young people. I know young people who act like they're 70 years older than they are. So when we, when we compartmentalize based on uh, age groups or generations or stereotypes, a lot of biases unfortunately come out. I would rather see what strengths you bring as a person. And if you, if you do that, then I can learn. So I'll give you a good example. Uh, we just went to Zoom calls, just like we're on right now. And uh, I am not uh, technically by the whole generation standard, I'm a boomer, uh, but I'm more of a Gen Xer because I've never really kind of followed the boomer thing. But I also do a lot of the Gen Z and Gen Y. See, I'm, I'm a blend. I think most people are. Very few people are very segmented just in their generation. When I introduced Zoom at our company, people were like, what do you mean? Video calls? What are you talking about? And there was this, all, this huge anxiety of people of all ages. <laughs> and I said, you know, all it is is talking. Now we just do a picture. That's all it is. So I had to teach people who are older and people who are younger that this was safe, viable, a great communication platform, as others are. It's not just Zoom. But if... I, all of their biases because of age started coming out. And so I had to say, I respect that. Let me teach you. And I'm going to, I'm comfortable with it. I'll show you by my behavior. I'm not going to force it on you. Uh, and we've learned and laughed and had a lot of things. Uh, but what's funny is the 16 year olds we have can learn from the 18 year olds. It's not 16 to 80. Cause it's funny. Once a person's within an organization, one to two years or two to three years, they think the people that are new that are coming in are just rookies and don't understand anything, regardless of their age. You know, I'm such a, you know, I look at me, I have such seniority, I'm so experienced. You're like, you've been here two years, what's going on? So age becomes a real detriment instead of saying, here's a new person, I was new, I remember what that was like, I'm going to pull you along. So it's, to me, it's reframing things so that age doesn't get in the way. That is so interesting, you know, and, and that's actually true because it's really in the mindset. So even a young person can be an 80 year old, but an old man or a woman can really be young at heart. And that's how it is. And that's how you see it. So, uh, you know, that is very interesting. And um, I also wanted to understand, you know, uh, how do you see the role of HR specifically as it concerns the retail business change? for human resources as a function post the epidemic, do you believe that there would be a new normal or would people, business and HR need to adjust to in the new reality? Yeah, I, I just wrote about this and I'm, it sounds odd to say that, uh, but I think HR has fallen into the leadership role it always should have had. This is different than the whole move 15, 18 years ago of seat at the table. That's so old fashioned and so awful. 
And what it means is when you have that mentality, it's a destination. Oh, I finally got here. Ah, oh, I can relax and look at me and now I have value. That is so backwards. We need to be people who lead every day. So now when this happened, organizations turn to HR first for the first time in my career. It's like, what do we do? How do we take care of our people? And so now we jumped in and already it's starting to turn to finance because it's becoming an economic issue, a legitimate economic issue. So HR is like, woo, we're done. Absolutely not. This is where we should step in even more. The door's been open and we need to keep people uh, as our focus going forward. When you look at this, this is going to give us a better chance to work on development, not reporting. It's going to give us a better uh, chance to elevate talent and assign people based on their strengths. And that's it. those two are HR things, period. And you can call it OD or learning, but we have the chance to drive that forward so that organizations are built for the future. So when the next challenge comes, because it's coming someday, we're ahead of it. And we don't go back to just doing administrative tasks where we're sitting there and saying, well, I'm just waiting for my next chance. Our chance is now. And we need to stay there. Uh, I've always felt that HR should be in the leadership capability. It doesn't mean title. It just means I lead from where I'm at. Too many people say, well, when I become the CHRO, now I'll be a leader. I know CHROs who are not leaders. Uh, I know frontline HR people who are not leaders. You can do this in any uh, industry, not just HR. So I don't want to be picking just on us. But my thing is, you should lead from where you're at. And I really think we can do it, and we should going forward. And by that, I mean, I model the behavior I expect in others. So if I want people to be uh, consistent, I need to be consistent. If I want people to be engaged, I need to be engaged. It is much more behavioral than anybody thinks. If you fix the behavior first, and you know that going in, all the tasks will fall underneath it. If you lead by a task first, your behaviors could be all over the board. It's funny, uh, I came up with a theory here recently. Uh, a lot of companies, and, and I try this out on my managers, most companies are results oriented first. So if we pull out the P&L and we pull out the, uh, how are we doing year over year, we look at numbers and data and we're data crazy. Data is good, but data lags, data is behind. It already happened. But we go, based on the results, we're gonna come up with the following processes. We go, cool. But the majority of day is spent on people, not on processes, on people. So my theory is uh, most companies are processes equal results. If I have the right processes, I'll get the right results. That's not true. It's if I focus on people and give them the right processes, I'll see better results. So my thing is people plus processes equals results. So if we do that, who works with people the most? HR. So it automatically, by following this formula, it puts us in a leadership ability in order for you to succeed, not me. Because I'm focused on you as the people who are making our company better. So it's more working and having others focused to drive processes and do results. And honestly, you'll come up with better processes than you ever had before. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very interesting theory, Steve. And Steve, you know, there are a lot of gig workers also, right? They're an integral part of the workforce right now. So how do you think we can improve the employee experience for this particular category? I think what this uh, pandemic has shown us is, uh, I'm old enough, Ash, that we used to fight telework, just fight it. And I'll get to the gig part in a second. So we fought telework. We thought everybody's going to be lazy and no one's going to work. And what we found out was it was just giving people a different perspective to do their work. So now the gig economy does the same thing. So now you have a field-based entrepreneurial workforce. The things that they want are the same things other people want in a more traditional workforce. They want to know their stability, connection, and the ability to be connected in their organization. So let's say I'm an Uber driver. I wanna know how am I connected to Uber? Is my pay consistent? What happens if there's a problem? If I have an employee relations issue, who do I talk to? 
all the same internal things you would have in a traditional organization, gig workers are focusing. The entrepreneurial side is the big differentiator because now you're working with 100% field-based staff in some sort of different industry. So my thing is understand the workforce that you have. So if I'm somebody who did HR and my workforce was more field-based only, how do I become the connector? How do I make those dots work for them? But understand that the dots that Mike has are different than the dots that Ash needs, and that's okay. Instead of saying, here's all the dots. That's what we tend to do. Here's the, here's the one thing that works for everybody, and it won't. It comes back to the individual side. Gig economy excites me because you really can practice HR on a much more individualized basis. I don't, I don't think we look at connection as leadership, and it is. Connecting people is probably the, one of the strongest leadership skills you could have in any organization. Because if I take someone from marketing and connect them to finance and they can work better, I've done my job. And they go, well, that's not HR. Well, heck, it isn't. If I make these two people work together, same thing. So for the gig person, it's how do I make sure their needs are being met? Because if I know that they're acknowledged, they'll be connected. And I've always thought that engagement is much more simply defined as if I'm connected to the organization, I'm engaged. So whichever, if I'm connected to a gig economy type job, I'm really connected to that. I buy into the, the philosophy, the brand. I understand my job. I understand the parameters from which I can work within. I'm engaged. I'll kick that kind of person every single day. If they're not connected, I either have to work on having them be connected inside the organization or have them find a job somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. It's about feeling belonged to the organization. And that really, really makes a difference. So, it absolutely does. So I completely agree with you there, Steve. And finally, to wrap this interview, interview up, I'm going to ask you the last question. If you have any other important sound bites that you'd like to leave our viewers with. I would like to encourage the people who watch this and that are in HR to enjoy what you do. We're the one industry that touches people's lives across the organization the one group. So that should have value to you. Uh, to know that I can talk to somebody and have a chance to positively encourage them and lift them up and value them for who they are, that will lead to more inclusion, genuine inclusion, not a program. That'll allow them to be the diverse people and wonderful people they already are. We, we have to quit trying to form things in these boxes and just allow things to kind of flow in a continuum. Uh, but you gotta love what you do. Uh, I love that people are messy. I, I, I call people messy and wonderful. I'm messy and wonderful. I think it should be that way. It's not controlled and confined. It allows me to be creative, innovative, uh, positive, and uplifting. And I think that makes organizations better when we allow HR to do that. Oh, I, I love that message, Steve, because all you're asking everyone is, to do is really be themselves. And there's nothing better than being yourself. So. Thank you so much for that message. I had a great time with you, Steve. Thank you so much for that engaging conversation. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Take care and have a healthy time ahead of you.